The next question that was proposed to the panel members had to do with breaking patterns. How do you break uh, dysfunctional patterns, particularly those that uh, show up a lot, it uh, seems, in, in families dealing with addiction? Uh, uh, patterns of enabling, uh, where uh, the addict's behavior is, on the one hand, judged, but on the other hand, is uh, supported, uh, even if uh, indirectly and most often unconsciously. Also, uh, patterns of codependency. I made reference to that earlier. I recently read a definition of codependency, which is, I help you, but at the expense of myself. I thought that was pretty parsimonious. But uh, 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 you know, if you have something as, as challenging to a family uh, uh, system as addiction, it stands to reason that there are going to be all kinds of compensations that develop that are uh, complicated, uh, are unhealthy, and uh, like I mentioned earlier with family homeostasis, actually can become really stuck, really get stuck. So what, what, are, some, what are some ways that, that those that are working with families in addiction, how are these uh, patterns being uh, addressed and, and hopefully broken? And so I want to come, uh, I'll start by coming from the direction of, um, uh, I won't come from therapy, I'll come from other resources in addiction, I'll come back to therapy at the end. <clears throat> The 12-step programs are, are uh, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, uh, Gamblers Anonymous, Overeaters Anonymous, and then all the spin-offs that relate to families, which are Al-Anon, Alateen, teens. Uh, Al-Anon is for family members. Alateen is specifically uh, teenage members, um, adult children of alcoholics. All of these, all of these programs, are based in the 12 steps and the Big Book of of, uh, of AA. And if there's one central thread through them that applies to this question, it's that, that there's a culture uh, in, in the 12-step programs of accountability. And so that the, the, the norm in meetings, inside and outside of meetings, is, uh, for example, if, if a family member is involved in Al-Anon, there's little, if any, support for talking about the family member's addiction so much as what am I, as an Al-Anon member, uh, doing that that is impeding recovery for that member. What am I doing to, uh, let's say, if I'm enabling, the focus is on my enabling, not on what a dastardly criminal my son or daughter is. Um, uh, and, and so the projections, that it's very hard not to scapegoat when you're angry at somebody, when you feel resentful, when you feel hurt, when you feel betrayed. You want to attack them and put them down and, and uh, Knock, knock some sense into their heads. And so the move in 12 steps is to withdraw the projection, take it back in and look at oneself to really clean one, one's own house. And so I think that that's a, a beginning right there is you have a whole culture. It's, uh, the, the 12 step movement is so far and away the biggest single intervention in terms of just population of people involved across the globe. Several million people today are going to 12 step meetings and this thread is, is being carried through all of them. Interestingly, there's actually accountability within AA and NA. They have, um, I don't know their term for them, but I'm going to call them inspectors right now. They have representatives coming out from central offices just to check in to make sure that the various meetings, which are all over the place, there are thousands and thousands of meetings uh, all over the world being held, um, to make sure that they, that they follow this this uh, this. this uh, kind of, uh, it's, I was going to say unspoken value, but it's actually part of the 12 traditions of, of the 12 steps is, uh, is to focus on oneself. So I, I think that that's one positive way of breaking patterns is that, that um, uh, you focus on what your contribution is as an individual. You don't focus on the identified patient so much. The conference I mentioned that I went to just a few weeks ago in Boulder, Colorado, uh, I had a chance to, I sat down with uh, John Dupuy, who I mentioned earlier, the author of Integral Recovery, and the integral theorist who's uh, really kind of uh, formed the theoretical seedbed of, of integral recovery um, is, is a man named Ken Wilbur, and he's been writing in this field for uh, about 35 or 40 years. I first encountered him at the beginning of my graduate school experience, and he's been prolific. He's published 20 or 30 books that are in every language imaginable, and they're all uh, it's unusual in academics, they're all still in print. Uh, and he, he continues to have a lot of impact, not just in psychology, but in politics, in environmentalism, in gender studies, uh, uh, spirituality, religion, etc. So I had a chance to sit down with Ken Wilbur for the first time with John Dupuy, and we spoke for an afternoon at his loft in Denver. Um, 
uh, about some of these questions and some of the things that came out in that conversation that pertain to how about breaking patterns is that both Ken Wilbur and John were united in saying that awareness is over half the battle. O awareness is over half the battle, which begs the next question, well then how does one get aware? And in that conversation, as well as in the conference in which it was kind of embedded or enclosed, were various practices such as um, mindfulness meditation. Mindfulness meditation has really picked up a lot of steam in the last uh, 10 years or so. Uh, we're here in the Los Angeles area. There's a Mindful Awareness Research Center housed by UCLA. Um, the big name is Daniel Siegel. He's done a tremendous amount of work in interpersonal neurobiology. I mentioned that in a previous segment. And uh, uh, applying it to different applications, including uh, addiction. And so there's research coming out today, working with brain scans and mindfulness meditation, which is nothing more complicated than stopping yourself, focusing on your breath, and beginning to move out of the kind of the constant rat race of thoughts that it serves physio physiological benefits as well as psychological benefits. And uh, also part of, part of any uh, uh, prayer or meditative practice is typically moving away from, from being so identified with what's happening to me outside so that I can begin to reflect from a slightly more objective, slightly uh, 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 maybe a dis more dispassionate perspective on what's going on, including my addiction or including my reactions to the addict. And so there was a lot of talk, including in this conversation I had with Wilbur and, and uh, John Dupuy, about encouraging families, uh, addicts and their families, to begin to practice some method that can be, uh, doesn't require seeing a therapist, doesn't require for me to see a therapist to sit down every morning and take 20 minutes just to focus on my breathing and, and be one step less attached to my reactivity. The idea with mindfulness meditation is that as you practice this, it begins to generalize from those 20 minutes in the morning to uh, bigger and bigger chunks of the day so that it becomes, the goal is not to be a meditator, the goal is to be mindful and it's to be where that becomes more of a habitual resource. And so, so when they talk about awareness is half the battle, that's one practical technique. They talked about other techniques and I won't go into detail about them right now, but one of them is referred to as shadow work where you work with with, for example, you can work with a dream that you had last night, or you can work with a reaction you had five minutes ago to a coworker, and uh, different ways of journaling that out, again, without, the, without having a therapist, just ways of processing emotion so that it doesn't uh, get repressed or get acted out. And for an addict, it's deadly, is, is that for an addict, um, a good bit of the work that goes on in 12-step programs is finding a way to vent shadow. Uh, the term shadow comes from the psychiatrist Carl Jung, and the shadow is just all the stuff that we repress out of conscious awareness. And his view was that even though, even though we might repress something, um, one author says that what's repressed is, is it's material that we forget that we forgot it. Um, um, and so you repress something and then you forget that you repressed it. And the idea uh, in most psychologies, uh, most psychological systems, is that that which is repressed may not be consciously remembered, but it's manifesting in some form, typically it manifests symptomatically. And so it may come out as uh, uh, you know, gastrointestinal distress, or it may come out as a rage attack or whatever. And uh, the work of a lot of therapy is trying to trace back various symptoms back to some kind of origin in material that's not being, not being dealt with honestly. And so a lot of therapy is about encouraging that kind of transparency with oneself. So again, awareness is half the battle in terms of breaking patterns uh, that are counterproductive in a family. And so this would mean that the work goes on within the family as well, that, that it's not enough to send your child out into the wilderness as an scapegoat, but that the family uh, has to uh, enter into their own work. And then I guess what I'm saying is that it doesn't require psychotherapy. Psychotherapy, I think, is, I believe that psychotherapy is probably necessary, but it's certainly not sufficient. Because if you see a psych psychotherapist once or twice a week, what do you do for the other 166 hours of the week? And there are a lot of tools that are useful. And um, people in recovery are talking about these tools. They're probably as important as the earlier conversation about um, therapeutic lifestyle changes, is to find ways to daily practice uh, uh, staying as aware as we can of our habitual thought patterns, our habitual emotional reactive patterns, and um, beginning to transform those. I mentioned that I think that therapy is necessary. I really do believe that because I don't think that any, anything can replace 
a really effective, well-trained, I believe family systems oriented therapist. If you're working with a family, you need to have some, some ground, uh, you need to have a lot of grounding beyond just looking at individual psychology. Again, the idea that no man is an island. And so an ability to imagine into and intervene with family systems. Frankly, it's interesting, I wanna say this, is that we, here at Cal Southern, we have a marriage and family therapy program, it's our master's program. Um, our doctoral students are required to take family systems oriented courses. The tricky part isn't the coursework, and I found this in my years of experience. The reality is that when you get out into the real world, it's getting families to cooperate with us. Burr Cook can say, if you don't come into therapy or come into recovery, your son or daughter is going to die. But that's just the beginning because most family members, as I mentioned earlier, don't sign on for that and aren't going to be agreeable to that. Uh, that's why I think he has to up the ante to get people's attention. And so it's getting people to be involved. We live in a, a modern era of incredible uh, involvement. You know this in your own family. Everybody's going every which way. How do you get a family together ever? Like for dinner would be a feat, you know, and much less setting aside a time to come together for some kind of family counseling. It's, it's uh, challenging, uh, never more so than in the modern era. But there's another piece, and I want to mention this about education, is that we can train people in education. Here at Cal Southern, we train, we train our students in family systems approaches across all of our programs, and more and more so addressing addiction. The, one of the tricks of it that I see is it's really hard. It's exponentially more difficult to sit with a couple than to sit with an individual. And then add to that more exponents in terms of sitting with family members that it's not, you don't, if you add two people, if you add a couple to a situation, it's not just two people, there's, there's some kind of multiplication of that because you have all these interactions going on be between them and now you and it's, uh, and frankly, it requires a lot more of a therapist. So a sad fact that I know of from my involvement here at the university is we interact with other universities that are also training marriage and family therapists. We're also engaged every month with the California Association of Man Marriage and Family Therapists, many, if not most, marriage and family therapists are loath to work with marriages and families. And uh, my read on it is I don't think that that's, uh, um, I think it's a problem, but I, I can, it's, it's, it, it's understandable why, why. It, 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 it's, it's a pound of flesh to do that work. It really requires being able, I'll give you one practical example. My partner, Colleen Kelly, is, is a marriage and family therapist who's been trained in what's called emotionally focused therapy with couples. It's very specialized. I taught marriage and family therapy for years at a graduate school level and, uh, and, and also did marriage and family therapy. And here's a situation that comes up all the time. You have a couple that come in. You never have a couple coming in that's happy to be there. Uh, they wouldn't be there if they were happy. And then let's throw in addiction into it to make it really incendiary. So you have a couple coming in, let's just say, let's say that, there's, that the, the, the wife has gone off to a rehab, she's, she's being reintegrated into the household, the husband and wife are sitting there trying to work out how they're gonna work this out and repair old wounds and so on. They're guaranteed to escalate in the office if you pay attention to their conflicts. And who of us wants to do that? I mean, it's not fun. This is why we get paid as therapists to do this. But there's a real, I think, like a moral, um, there's like a moral issue here. If, if, you're gonna, if you're gonna work with individuals because it's easier and send the individual out of your office back into a family environment where the whole thing um, uh, goes off the rails predictably, then how can you sleep at night? Is that it's really, it's really on therapists, I think, to develop the skills and the thick skin and I mentioned, I mentioned Colleen's work in, in emotionally focused therapy. Much of that therapy is learning how to de-escalate conflict. Uh, uh, it's impossible for any of us to make progress on any issue, maybe especially addiction. I mentioned earlier, if we're ashamed, you can forget about it. It shuts down the system. The emotional centers that, 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 uh, through which shame is rooted effectively trump the frontal cortex about which, uh, th that you need to, for making good sound judgment, for example. It's offline. The same thing with anger. So if you have a couple that's extremely aroused and activated in therapy, what do you do as a therapist to help calm that down? And there are now skillful means. There weren't 10, 20, 30 years ago. There are now skillful means in a research literature backing it up that, it, that it's absolutely required that you work with families, and these are the skills you're going to need to survive it intact. And, and you teach the family these skills so that the family can learn how to self-regulate. So 
in terms of the actual therapy about breaking cycles, it's a challenging work for sure, and there's no end to the need. I think part of what we're doing here at Cal Southern is trying to train our students. By the way, we, we, we bring in, Colleen is now on the faculty here at Cal Southern. We bring in master lecture presenters that are presenting various approaches, including emotionally focused approaches to working with couples, so that, that when you're working with a family that's falling apart and uh, addiction is, is guaranteed to lead to that kind of uh, uh, situation coming into therapy, that you have the skills in hand to be able to work with them to break some of the cycles. I mentioned one other practical thing too, so we don't end on a depressing note. John Dupuy, who I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the author of Integral Recovery, I, I spoke with him at this same conference about what he's done over the years. He works in wilderness therapy with addicts, that is they come to southern Utah and they go on wilderness expeditions and so it's kind of a survival type of deal that they do. And, um, and, and uh, you strip away all distraction and there you are with mother nature and extreme cold, extreme hot, etc. And it tends to put you face to face with whatever the shadow is, whatever the demons are that need to be dealt with. He brings families into southern Utah so the family member comes in for treatment for the first few weeks. He'll bring a family in for a week, and he has a family workshop approach that he uses, and I'm gonna give you the four things he focuses on because they're memorable and they all make sense. I think they'll ring true. Is that he helps families in these family workshops. So he'll sit down, let's say the mother and the father are sitting with, with their uh, uh, adolescent or young adult son or daughter. He helps them move into a dialogue where all parties get a chance to voice, first of all, their resentments. As I mentioned earlier, the amount of pain that a family has to endure uh, uh, in and around addiction is so major that, that trust has been completely broken. So you have to address the resentments that have piled up, the, the infidelities that have eroded uh, a trust and connection. And so the very first thing they do is they talk, they, they talk and he helps facilitate dialogue between the various family members with the addict in recovery and vice versa around resentments that they have. Um, uh, then you move from that into being able to talk about regrets. Regrets about things that you said and did, regrets that the addict said and did, and a chance to begin to bring that into the conversation. And then, and then next you move into offering respect for one another. What do you respect about the person? When things get so negative, in the cycle of addiction, things get so incredibly skewed towards the negative is that there's almost no respect anywhere. And so underneath all of that, only when you've worked through resentments and uh, uh, regrets, sorrows, and sadnesses is their ability to begin being affirming with one another. And then finally, uh, the, the four R's, resentments, regrets, respects, and requests. As you ask for requests for behavior change, I really need for you to do this if you're gonna come home again. And if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna be in support of my sobriety, I need you as parents to support me in this and that way. And the goal of all of this is to repair what is uh, uh, commonplace, in fact it's universal in addiction within families, which are there have been huge uh, ruptures in relationship and the goal is to repair and this is some of how the reparative work is established.